that is my real name. Hey, let's just say that, that's my real name, Kenton Cool. I am a professional mountaineer, but arguably more uh, relevant than that, I'm a professional mountain guide. And what we do, we professionally guide our clients through anything they may want to do, or perhaps they don't even know that they want to do it yet, uh, in, in the mountains, be it skiing or climbing. And I found myself um, being gravitated towards this particular mountain. Uh, the one on the left-hand side is, is Mount Everest, and this is where I found the niche. And what I'm going to do here this evening is just tell you one or two of the things that I've learned from working in my environment. I work at 8,000 meters above sea level. It's known as the death zone. It's called the death zone very simply because when the human body gets above about seven, seven and a half thousand 7,500 meters, we can't cope with the low pressure. We can't cope with the lack, lack of oxygen. So our bodies, very simply put, start to shut down. We die. Climbers are pretty simple people, uh, hence the name the death zone, because that's where you die. And what I do, I take my clients into the death zone. I actively go out there, seek clients, build a relationship, and then take them into the death zone to fulfill their dreams. I was interviewed just recently, and somebody said, well, how do you describe yourself? Are you a climber? Are you an adventurer? Are you a mountaineer? Are you a skier? And I think in my work capacity, I'm a facilitator. People come to me with their problems. You know, they, they want to go out to the greater world and climb these things. Perhaps it's Everest, perhaps it's Mount Lhotse, perhaps it's Mont Blanc, perhaps it's the Eiger. And I facilitate it. I put it together, I find a solution, and then I execute what they want to do. I had what's known as a near miss on Everest. I used to work with uh, a multiple of clients at any one time. Uh, I used to work up with, with up to five, five individual clients. We used to congregate in Kathmandu, travel to the mountain, and then attempt to climb and get back down safely. And after 20, 2010, I realized that my working practice, along with everybody else's, I thought was fundamentally flawed. And I took a really hard look at how I operated on the mountain. And I didn't really like um, what I saw. So I spent about two years looking around. What is the better option? How else can we approach this mountain? Because what we were doing, the industry, the commercial industry behind climbing Everest, I thought was outdated and antiquated. It was all based on the, what happened in the aftermath of the 96 Everest disaster. So, um, so I found myself at a junction in my life, in terms of my, my professional life. And I, what I decided to do, I, I was going to work with a small bunch of clients, clients that I would nurture, clients that I would build relationships with, and then look after after the event. So I wasn't just a, a wham, bam, you climb Everest, I'll never see you again. My, my whole philosophy on how I climbed and how I looked after my clients dramatically changed. My colleagues, my um, competitors thought I was absolutely barking mad. Now, six years on, I have a thriving business in what I do. I have the highest hit rate. A hit rate is what uh, Everest climbers call success rate. Why it's called hit rate, I've no idea. I got an 82% hit rate of getting my clients successfully to the top and back down. The next nearest rival, if you want to, to put it that way, is hovering around 60%. I've, I've proved to myself and my colleagues and the industry that there is a different way of working. And what I'm going to do this evening is try to explain how, why, and essentially give you a little insight onto how I look after my clients. For me, it all starts with the team. So this guy in the, um, on my shoulder here is Dorji Gelgin. Dorji Gelgin is my number one Sherpa. So it, it, essentially, he's my, my climbing Sirdar. I don't step foot on the mountain without this man. The man in the background, and he is always in the background, is, Kar, uh, is Kami. Kami is my logistics guy. He's a guy that, that, that works out all those, all those little things that nobody wants to get involved with. Tentage, amount of oxygen, is everything there in the right place where it needs to be? Do we have enough food on the mountain? All the supplies and movements on the mountain. And every expedition used to take eight or nine weeks from leaving the UK to getting back. What we can do now with careful client, care client management, and to, to coin a phrase, you know, careful guiding, is bring that down. We're not cutting corners. What we're doing, we're providing a level of service above and beyond what is expected from you. Even though we're working in the 
in the environment which is considered by many to be the most dangerous working environment in the world. Say Joe Bloggs comes to me and says, I want to climb Mount Everest. Well, that's great because that's what my business thrives on. But then somewhere along the line, I've got to sort of start to introduce him or her to the rigours of high altitude climbing. And then I've got to start to explain to that individual what the dangers are. Because the dangers are very, very real. Because up to this point here, at Camp 2 on Everest, 6,400 metres, things are relatively benign. We know what the controllables are. I use this term, control the controllables. In the mountains, there are so many uncontrollables out there that I have no control about rockfall or avalanches sometimes or the weather systems. They're way beyond my control. From this point going upwards, well, that's when the pressure starts to mount up. And I'm asking my client to, to stand shoulder in shoulder with me. So I need to have a really strong, really strong relationship. On Everest, one thing I really have to instill into my clients and my team is this, the time, the turnaround time. We have a set time, no matter where we are on the mountain, we turn around, leaving enough daylight and resources and energy to get back down. It's a deadline, the non-negotiable deadline. There's no flexibility, none whatsoever. And I find myself working more and more in the corporate world with sponsors and various supporters. And you also have deadlines, don't you? What do deadlines mean to you? Well, my little understanding of deadlines in the corporate world is, well, actually, they mean very little. Deadlines are somewhat flexible. They're a bit hazy at the edges. It's limestone. And where does limestone start its life? Bottom of the sea. And now where is it? Top of the world. You're not that impressed by that, are you? <laughs> and complacency has no place in mountaineering. If you become complacent in mountains, it will kill you. Conversely, if you become complacent in business, everybody else will catch up with you. This is the summit ridge of Everest. I think it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. But for many people, is absolutely horrifying. This is where I start to really earn my money. This is where I deliver a service which very few people on the planet can. I have the vision. I have the understanding about what my clients need. And what I do, I place it all together. I build a team that I need and they need, and then we execute. And when we get to this point, there really is no turning back. There is no second chance from here. If we turn around now, we're not coming back on the same expedition. As we get to the top of Everest, it's his third attempt, my second attempt with him, and I'm so over the moon that we finally got there. I love working with Ran, but it's quite high maintenance at the same time. And I literally, I sink to my knees. I'm like, Ran, Ran, we're there. God, God, we're there. And I kid you not, this is a true story. He takes his oxygen mask off and goes, what? We've got to go higher? <laughs> and I, no, God, jeez, we're on top of the, where do you go from the summit of Everest? The sun's just going down, and a call comes over the radio, and there's a stricken climber at the high camp, and can we help? I don't like getting involved with that sort of stuff. It, uh, it's, it's noise, it's, you know, it's things on the periphery. You've got to be really focused at 8,000 metres, and I don't like things distracting me. But you have, you're morally obliged. So we got involved, and I spent all night with a Taiwanese climber called Mr. Lee, trying to keep him alive. His team has essentially left him. He bought into a poor logistical support, and when, when things went wrong, they had no backup for him, and they essentially left him to die. And somebody else was left to pick up the pieces, me and Georgie. We did our very best for him, but he passed away about 6 o'clock in the morning after a fairly epic battle all night long to try and keep him alive. Biggest reason for clients not getting up Everest? Mentally, they don't believe they can do it. If you can put that vision into the palm of their hand, if you can give them the confidence that they can do it, then they are capable of doing it. And then somebody like myself comes along and we carefully guide them all the way up. We transform what they believe that they can do 
one of the key things that I do that sets me apart from my competition, and I don't really like doing this, but I thought I'd just write them down more for myself because I would forget them rather than anybody else. And, and this is one of the key ones. The ability to adapt to the changing environment. That, for me, is absolutely critical. That's what sets me apart from my competition. Small, agile teams and the ability to constantly adapt. The importance of setting clear goals. I, yeah, I work with individuals and I work with teams. If those people don't know what we're setting out to do, we will never get there. You need those clear goals. Taking personal responsibility. As much as I try to nurture and guide my, my clients through things, there has to be a point where they accept responsibility. And it could be as easy as saying, yes, that is what we're going to do. I can set all, all the parameters out for them, but at some stage they have to say, yes, this is what I want, this is how I want to do it. Effective teamwork. I'd love to stand here and say, God, I'm an amazing climber. I've climbed Everest 12 times. It's not about me. It's about myself, Dorji, and the team. I have a brilliant team. That's why I'm successful in the mountains. That's why the clients come to me. I might be the salesman, but it's that whole team underneath me. It's Dorji and his team, Lakpa Onchu, Padawa, Kami. The effective teamwork. We all know what we're doing. Clear communication. It's all completely irrelevant unless you have clear communication. Everybody needs to know what they're doing, when they're doing it. When is it going to be implemented? When are we going to execute? If you get all of those points right, all five, then what you have is seamless execution. And at 8,000 meters, there can be no other way. Adventure is a learning tool of the next generation. The outdoors is our biggest classroom that we have. And if we can instill into the next generation the importance of things like teamwork, of humility, leadership, and understanding about what's important, then all of us, all of us will have a better future because our future is in the hands of the next generation. Thank you.